My mission here is not to scale blockchains with optimistic technology. It's to scale blockchains with the best technology available, and that allows me to be fully flexible. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your support helps us reach more listeners and bring you more exciting content in the future. Hello, and welcome to The Crypto Brief, a podcast from Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. Every week we get together to discuss current events and trends in blockchain technology, tokenization, DeFi, NFTs, mining, and related aspects of the crypto ecosystem. I'm your co-host, Ryan Stubbe, Director of Bitcoin Mining, and I'm joined by Jason Ward, Head of the Blockchain Incubator, Parth Gargava, Product Architect with Fidelity Labs, and Jack Newrider, Research Analyst with Fidelity Digital Assets. Before we begin, just a friendly reminder that this discussion is for educational purposes only and should not be viewed as investment advice or a recommendation for any security or asset. The views expressed are those of the co-hosts and not necessarily those of Fidelity Investments or its affiliates. As we all know, crypto as an asset class is highly volatile, can become illiquid at any time, and is only for those investors with a high risk tolerance. Let's dive into what's been happening recently. Hey everyone, today is a really special day. And the reason why it's a special day is because I'm sitting in this virtual room with a crypto giga brain, Steven. I'm so incredibly excited to introduce you to my crypto friend, Steven Goldfeder. Steven is the CEO and co-founder of Offchain Labs, the company behind one of the biggest scaling solutions on Ethereum called Arbitrum. Welcome to the show, Steven. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Stephen, before we get started, I want to share a quick story with you. So uh, in 2017, I was getting in this space of understanding how to read Bitcoin transaction data and do some sort of on-chain analysis. And I remember we used to have this geeky club called uh, the Journal Club, where we would choose a crypto research paper and discuss it with engineers and enthusiasts. And so when it was my turn, I chose to talk about this paper called BlockSci, which was probably the most interesting paper of that time. And a few months after, I spoke to the author of BlockSci at Cornell. Now, funnily enough, this person was now presenting on something called as Arbitrum State Channels, which at the time seemed like black magic. And that person was you, Stephen. <laughs> so, so you know how I've been following your work since BlockSci, but I would love to know your story before Arbitrum, before Offchain Labs. Can you can you share with the audience what was BlockSci and how did you get from BlockSci to Arbitrum? Absolutely, yes, and great to reconnect and great to be here today. So I was a PhD student at Princeton, uh, at Princeton University and I started there in about 2013 and that's when I uh, really first learned in a, any technical way about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but really Bitcoin at the time and took an interest there. My advisor was Arvind Narayanan and another professor in my group was Ed Felton. Fast forward, he's uh, currently my co-founder at Offchain Labs. And uh, they were super interested in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, this fascinating te new technology. I was primarily interested in cryptography. And I was interested in how to marry these two. I used to say, like, you know, I work at the intersection of crypto and crypto because crypto used to mean cryptography, <laughs> but I've given up that battle a long time ago. Um, but anyway, so there were a few interesting threads that I worked on uh, the hair. Um, threshold cryptography and multi-party computation was one. Um, we wrote a textbook, uh, um, which is used a computer science text for cryptocurrencies with Ed and Arvind and some others as well. And BlockSci actually, so BlockSci actually, the primary author was... Um, Harry Kolodner, who's my other co-founder at the company uh, at Offchain Labs. And the idea was there just wasn't, you know, we have today tools like Chainalysis and lots of commercial tools. It was really early on back then. I actually remember um, like Johnny from Chainalysis reaching out to us, interested in what we were doing. And, you know, it was early on for a lot of these tools and their maturity. And we were just building it out um, from an academic perspective as we were Arbitrum. So it's funny because a lot of the projects that I did were on the periphery of networks. So I worked on how to secure assets uh, networks. We worked on how to analyze and even collect transaction data network analysis on these networks. Um, but then one question we had was, let's like, you know, we're always like dancing around the periphery here. Can we actually build one of these networks, build it in a way that solves a real problem? That problem was scaling. At the time, the problem was extremely theoretical because there was no Ethereum. If you look back, uh, where did Arbitrum start? Actually, before my days in Arbitrum, when Ed was involved, it was a class project at Princeton. 
at a seminar on cryptocurrencies. I actually was in that class working on an MPC wallet, <laughs> but uh, um, Ed was leading this project called Arbitrum. And if you look on YouTube, you'll find a video of the uh, end of class um, se seminar where each team presented their project. You'll find a team of undergrads that worked with Ed on this initial, initial, initial prototype of Arbitrum. And if you look at the date there, it's gonna it's fall 2014 semester. Remember that. No way. Yeah. So Ethereum went live July of 2015. So maybe you know six months later after this video, because this was like the end of the semester. It just gives you an idea of how early um, Ed uh, was thinking about this problem of scaling. And Ed went off to the White House. He was the deputy CTO and the uh, of the of the U.S. government and also senior advisor to President Obama. He came back, and Harry and I knocked on his door and said, "Hey." That Arbitrum thing, like we should build it because at the time we thought we thought that scaling had become a really big problem. Now, this was like the Crypto Kitties era, and like and now we look back and it's funny, like you know, now we have a problem. We say, but then like everything was still great uh, in retrospect. But the idea is that um, we were interested in not being on the periphery of the, of the technology more for this project. Actually, saying, hey, can we build out a system that has better plumbing that can scale more that can produce produce more transactions all without compromising on security and fast forward you know that con initial conversation was in 2017 then we published uh, an academic paper in the summer of 2018 and fast forward five years later that's also when we founded the company here we are uh, in the company having actually uh taken these ideas, further developed them, and actually built uh, products into production and given our users real transaction, cost relief, in, in increased throughput, et cetera, with the technology that we've developed. And of course, it's not just the three of us anymore. Even then, actually, there were there were others on the paper as well, but now it's a, a large team that you know, we could not have done and accomplished what we've done today. And it's also a large team and a large community, all critically important to what we've accomplished. So, so Stephen, before we get into Arbitrum, I, did you ever feel like, ah, uh, I missed the opportunity to build a business like Chainalysis Elliptic or, or, or maybe something like Fireblocks based on your work on threshold cryptography? Yeah. So I actually was very involved in the early days, um, of a lot of those companies. I remember like when Michael was, uh, Fireblocks was starting up, you know, I would support them technically, uh, similar. There was a company called Curve that was, mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, acquired by PayPal. I would talk to Itai and Dan or the co-founders there and try to help them. My goal back then was not to commercialize, was really to um, help and, you know, build this out from a research perspective. And what does a researcher want? They want to see their ideas and their protocols used. So that was my core objective then. Um, and actually, you know, sort of, I never really sat down and said, all right, I want to, uh, you know, build a business. It was sort of, you know, one thing led to another. We built out Arbitrum and it was clear there was like, tremendous need and potential for that and we're like all right we want to do this ourselves we want to build this we want to commercialize this in a way that actually takes these ideas and bring them to practice but it was sort of a gradual uh slope but i never like felt the need that i felt that i missed it i was i was super happy as i still am for the success of these companies um even if i wasn't uh directly you know involved um you know i was involved in the periphery in many of these cases and helping them step up but also you know it was the proliferation of the, of the technology that i had spent years working on and others by the way have you know spent now in the even in the academic circle some of the stuff that I did is a bit dated because others have built on, built on, built on, and built on it as well. And that's and that's not like a bad thing. That's exciting. Yeah. I mean, it's like you know you built something here, and you and and then if it's successful, others will continue to pick up the baton, grow the space, and grow the ecosystem. So um, yeah, I don't think I felt I was, I was super happy to see the success as I as I still am. Yeah. No. And and obviously you did well for yourself because now you're you're leading along with Ed and Harry Off Chain Labs. I want to learn more about your journey as a founder, right? Because I I'm naturally curious about what is it like for being a founder with your background of being a cryptographer and engineer, because it's such a unique background and you don't really see it that often. Is it is it hard to be a founder for someone who was who did threshold cryptography? Let me put it this way. It's definitely a different set of problems to solve, a different skill set, and not one that I had, uh, I guess, formal training for. But uh, you pick up a lot along the way. You know, you make some mistakes, you do some things right, you see what sticks, and you you try, you keep trying, keep building to learn on the job for sure. I guess the story is, you know, so my co-founders are Ed and Harry. So Ed was, I mentioned, um, a longtime professor at Princeton. Harry was also a PhD student with me at Princeton. So you might wonder, like. How did I get the CEO role? How did we sort of define this? So I remember this well. We were like standing outside one of our buildings at Princeton, uh, the Sherrod Hall, which is the building where uh, you know we had our offices. And um, the conversation went something like, you know, hey, Stephen, 
you seem to talk on the one or two calls we have. You talk the most in these calls. You should be the CEO, and you know, Harry, you, you're you know, you write a lot of the code. Uh, you should be the CTO, and uh, Ed was naturally a professor who did a lot of you know both as well, and you know, chief scientists made a lot of sense. And at the time, like this was like a decision with very very delayed, um, if, you know, delayed reaction or delayed effect. It didn't take into didn't take into come into effect right away because. You know, to the extent that there were calls, we were all on those calls. To the extent that there was code to be written, we were all contributing. To the extent that there was research spec, we were all doing it all. So it was like, sure, this title doesn't really mean very much. But if you fast forward over time, as we built up, that was sort of the blueprint for how we would specialize over time and the different things they would do. So it's definitely been a, an interesting ride for me. Um, it took me out of my, I guess, initial comfort zone. And um, in many ways, you know, I do a lot less of those things now. I do almost, you know, you know very little um, development, basically no development and, you know, uh, very little uh, hands-on research now. So I miss, definitely miss it a little bit. And, yep. you know, there'll probably be a time where I'll uh, want to get more involved in that again. But for right now, I think that there is an important problem to um, help coordinate these pieces and bring this, you know, into, te into this technology into production and continue its use and proliferation. So I'm happy to be on this journey, but it's definitely been, uh, you know, an interesting one personally. Yeah, no, that 100% that makes sense. And so even before you decided on who's going to do what or what responsibilities you're going to take, can you tell us more about that aha moment when you were like, hey, I, I got to build Arbitrum with, with Harry and Ed? Like, do you remember that? Yeah, so... It was basically, so the summer of 2018 was when we published the research paper, um, but we all also had like, you know, full-time commitment. So Ed was at Princeton still, Harry was at Princeton still. I did a postdoc at Cornell, Cornell Tech, IC3, which, you know, you referenced, uh, um, you know, via that event, the boot camp, of course. And so it was sort of like, hey, we should do this, but it wasn't a very like full-time commitment. We didn't know what it meant. And then... Again, it wasn't really an aha, the aha, aha moment was, hey, we want to see this in production. We didn't know what that meant. How do we go about this? We started having conversations. I guess the real aha moment was when, okay, we raised funds for the company, mm -hmm. um, which happened like um, in early of 2019. And that's when it just became very, very real. We had funding and slowly um, each of us, you know, um, let go of our other commitments so we could focus full time on, at off chain labs, to build this technology and gradually build the team. That part was gradual. But, you know, there definitely was like a moment back in the office of Princeton where we're like, all right, this is super interesting. This is amazing. We need to build this. The how, though, and what that meant and what that meant for our careers, like, was not clear at the time, but it sort of took a lot on a life of its own gradually. Wow, that's that is fascinating. So so I want to kind of switch gears and I want to talk about uh, Arbitrum and different scaling solutions. And uh, so one of my uncles is re recently getting used to Ethereum, right? So he okay. just set up his MetaMask wallet. Nice. And now I'm I'm at a point where I want to explain the concept of rollups, but it's kind of hard to explain rollups to someone who's non-technical. How would you explain this concept and, and why should people care about rollups like Arbitrum? Okay, that's a great question. So the answer is, if you what, what are like smart contracts? doing so that's not a good place to start so the idea of what a smart contract is i assume most people here know that but the idea that you can you know automate and take out middlemen is so sort of automate interactions and have like this computer that we all agree on the rules and it does things for us but the problem is um if you take a you know if you do this i don't want to say naively but in a straightforward way you have a pretty limited capacity so you have a single computer that everyone's sharing resources on now you want this computer to be secure you want it to be decentralized. You also want it to scale. These are sort of three prongs of what's sometimes called like the blockchain scaling like trilemma, um, which uh, you know Vitalik's obviously talked about in the past, as have many others. And the idea is that we can we know how to do these things. Like if you give up on one or the other, we kind of kind of very simple. Like you can take a completely centralized system, like take an AWS machine, and everyone can access it and build applications on it. But you're sort of giving up on the decentralization and the security. You can also have a network that um, has you know um, many nodes involved. But then the question is, how much compute power should you, should these nodes require? And that's that's an interesting one that people sometimes don't, sometimes don't understand. They say, okay, why don't you just 
turn up the capacity and you know tell the nodes to work faster because it turns out ethereum is a shared computer that's basically what it is but it's a really slow computer it's like a lot less powerful than my laptop and then you know naively the question is all right just make it more powerful like why are we limiting the capacity so much we have better computing just make it much more powerful and they're, they're scaled and there are some alternative layer one chains that, that do this and, and i'm not here to pass judgment on them but i'll tell you what they give up on in my opinion what they give up on is the security and decentralization because the problem is, as you make it harder to run one of these nodes, so you make the storage requirements harder, or you make the computational requirements harder, the bottom of the network, you know, they fall off. So those, you know, trying to follow along at home and participate and add to the security can no longer participate. And at the very extreme, you could have a situation in which you need to have your own data center to participate. So it might not be AWS because it might be open. It is a decentralized network that anyone can participate. But de facto will be centralized because if you need to have a data center, well, not many people have a data center lying around. So Ethereum really indexes hard on keep it decentralized and keep it secure. And that requires having a diversity of nodes that's important for decentralization. And that in turn requires keeping the, the compute requirements and the storage requirements, so the c computational uh, hardware requirements um, relatively low for people to participate mm -hmm. in the network. And that directly affects scalability. Okay, so then it just, if you're keeping those requirements low, the amount of computation to work that they can directly do is low. And the way that layer one blockchains work is every node has to verify all the computation directly. So you have a, and they're mostly sequential systems. So now you have a, you know, a bottleneck here. And you, know, you think about how do we support like, transactions like the levels of like what some payment processors do and it becomes very hard and difficult to see how you can do that in this architecture so what rollups do is they say okay let's take a lot of that computation off chain let's more smartly utilize the ethereum validators capacity and not have them verify all these transactions so for example if there are a ton of transactions coming in we're not going to you know these ethereum validators or these ethereum uh, nodes are pretty limited in their capacity to compute because we artificially restrict that because we want security decentralization but they're pretty limited let's try to get more mileage um for our you know more more bang for our buck if you will um, out of these ethereum validators and not send them every transaction so what we do is we take a lot of transactions off chain so there's some off-chain environment we'll call this layer two mm -hmm. and you send all your transactions there and then you roll up the results and post it back to Ethereum. So rather than having Ethereum um, block producers or Ethereum nodes verify every single transaction um, that goes through these networks, you take a lot of them off chain and just send the result back to Ethereum and say, hey, all these transactions happened, this is the result. Now, the question you may have is, well, what have we accomplished? The whole thing we want, the reason we want this decentralized network is, is because we want them to put their stamp of approval and verify these transactions and hey, I verify these transactions. If you're just going off chain and just sending me back like the result of like, hey, here's what happened and we're not verifying them, that's not good. We don't get the security of Ethereum. So the hard question is, okay, how do we take all this stuff off chain? and also bring back the result on chain and allow the validators to verify it. Well, the simple way is just have them run the computation, but then no, that's exactly what we don't want them to do. That's where the bottleneck is. So in one word, what rollups do is they use a technique called prove it. They just prove to you in an efficient way what happened off chain. And we have these really cool proving technologies that allow you to do all sorts of computation off chain and go ahead and prove to the Ethereum uh, block producers, prove to the Ethereum nodes what happened that they can easily verify. And when I say easily verify, they can verify for much, much, much less cost than actually running that computation. Now that seems magical, right? So you're doing all this computation off chain and you're asking the Ethereum nodes to verify it and you're giving them some magical proof that allows them to verify it without actually having to run all of it, without actually checking all, all the details. And that's what rollups do, they prove. And there are two other brief details I'll say. Um, how they prove really that that's where you might, you know, you might question me, well, I heard there are different types of rollups. Right. That's where we can get to there. I'll leave that for now. You know, feel free to ask if you're, if you know, if, if you will, but where ZK rollups and optimistic rollups differ is how they prove everything I said so far applies to all rollups equally. And the second point I'll say is you might, you know, we've, we've discussed proving the results of transactions, but an equally important question is how do we even agree on which transactions were included, right? If I think transactions A, B, C were included, and you're looking at a set of transactions called B, C, D, right? So we have some overlap, some the same, some different. 
we're not going to even hope to get through a result on like what the result of the computation is because we don't even know what the inputs are, right? So if you think of a machine that has inputs and outputs, we have inputs and then we do something and then we get outputs. So if we all agree on the inputs, you can imagine how proof would get you to the outputs. But it's critical we all agree on the inputs. And so what rollups do is they do the dumbest thing that you could do is they say, okay, just take all that input data, compress it as well as you can. But put it in, in full, in a way that's fully uh, decompressible, right? Fully, uh, you can get back to the original data, put it in full on Ethereum directly. So anyone can just look to Ethereum and get the inputs. And that makes the problem really simple. So all we're talking about is proving the outputs. But there's no different you know, questions on which transactions we're including, what the ordering of transactions are. That's all posted on Ethereum. So everyone can look to Ethereum, see the inputs. Mm -hmm. Ethereum is not actually doing anything with that data. To Ethereum, that's just a blob of data. It doesn't know what it is, doesn't care what it is. It's not running, you know, the transaction might say, Add these two numbers. Ethereum is just putting those zeros and ones on, on it for data availability, if you heard that term. It's not doing the computation. That happens off chain and it's getting back the result with a proof. And you may remember, and I think you were involved in this actually, Plasma. Plasma, which is like the precursor to rollups, tried to solve this data availability problem and didn't even want to put all the data on chain. And that turned to be a very out to be a very, very hard problem. And rollups said, you know what? Sure, like it would be great if we could get the data off Ethereum and the computation off Ethereum. But you know what? We'd solve a really, really big problem. We'd get pretty far if we just said, forget about that first problem. Just put all the data on Ethereum. Let's just worry about the computational scaling. And it turns out you can get a ton of scaling that way. So rollups punted on one of the big problems that Plasma tried to deal with. They just did the simplest thing possible, literally put the data on Ethereum. That's that's a great way of explaining what rollups are. So maybe let me just... know how it works with your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so so just to summarize more, because Ethereum is a world computer and it's one of the slowest computer ever, the computation is going to be done off chain. But you naturally rely on Ethereum for security. Is that is that a good summary? Exactly. And how you get that is is proving. Yes. Got it. Okay. And so, so that kind of leads to what kind of proving mechanisms do you have? And, and a lot of us have heard about optimistic rollups, CK rollups. It almost seems like you have new kinds of rollups popping over every single day. Could you explain what they are? Yeah, most rollups follow one of the two optimistic or ZK rollup paradigm. Um, there are some points that you can, you know, you can get really uh, into the weeds and try to, you know, say there are different types of ZK rollups, different types of optimistic rollups. But that's, I think, the best, uh, you know, place to really separate rollups and you can really encapsulate most rollups, uh, encapsulate most rollups in this, in this sort of dichotomy. And that is you have, you know, taking out the technical terms for a second. So we're taking all this, these transactions off chain. We're called that layer two. You have these other sets of computers, we call them layer two validators, that are actually running the transactions and coming up, taking the inputs. They're looking to Ethereum. They get the inputs there. They run it through their machine and they get the outputs. The machine they're running it through is deterministic. So assuming they have the same inputs and they're doing the honest thing, they're going to get the same result. It's not like there's like randomness or any sort of uh, non-determinism in the machine. It's completely deterministic, right? And remember, the inputs everyone agrees on, they just look at Ethereum. So all that these validators have to do is run the result and send it back to Ethereum. And they send it back, remember, with a proof. And the proof should be such that Ethereum can validate this and say, hey, I didn't actually run all these transactions, but I myself am fully confident that this result posted to me is the result. I am not actually trusting those validators, right? They're just relaying information to me, but I am directly validating it via proof. So there are two proofing mechanisms. I'll start with uh, one called the easier one to maybe understand, which is a validity proof. Well, you go ahead and you say, hey, I ran this off chain. This is, these are the inputs. We all know the inputs. They're on Ethereum. This is the outputs. And by the way, here's a mathematical proof, a validity proof that it is correct. And Ethereum miners can, t or Ethereum, you know, uh, nodes, I should say, can take that and go ahead, verify that proof. And the property that this proof has is that the verification should be succinct. You may have heard of something called a snark or a stark, and the S stands for succinct. What that means is, it's a short verification. So even if the computation is really long, they can verify it very, very quickly and easily um, at a fixed cost generally, or certainly a very low cost. That's what call, it's called the validity proof. And that's actually the approach used by ZK rollups. 
It's conceptually easy to understand because it's what you'd expect. You give me something and you prove it to me. Um, but it turns out from an implementation perspective, that actually is much more difficult and has some um, uh, trade-offs that you need to make in order to, to pull it off. But, but I'll leave that there for now. The other type of proof is what we call an optimistic roll-up or an optimistic proof. And here what you do is you run all this computation off-chain. So if some validator comes and says, hey, Ethereum, I ran all this off-chain, here it is. Here is the result, but keyword optimistically, I'm not going to give you a proof at all, right? So I'm optimistic that you're going to accept it and not going to give you a proof at all. But remember, there's a network of validators. It's not just one validator. So any other validator can go ahead and say, hey, hey, remember, it's all posted on Ethereum, this interaction. I go ahead and I post the result to Ethereum. Another validator can say, hey, that result that you posted to Ethereum is actually incorrect. And by the way, I'm going to engage with you now in a fraud proof process. So rather than give a validity proof, which proves something is correct, I'm going to give you a fraud proof, which proves that actually that's incorrect. What you said that is incorrect. And it turns out that it's super, it's much more efficient to prove that something's incorrect via the fraud proof mechanism than it is to prove that something is correct. And, and the second point of efficiency as well is usually you won't have to engage in these proofs. So there are different, um, um, incentives involved that make it expensive to to lie, right? There's no incentives. This is a point where sometimes people get wrong. They say, oh, optimistic rollups rely on game theory. That's not true at all. It relies on Ethereum for correctness. So if a validator comes and engages the proof, Ethereum, which has the initial rules of the rollup encoded in it, will get to the correctness. The only point of incentives in the game theory is to make it um, not so, you know, not so viable or not, or not so um, attractive for me to just spend the system and send you know bad challenges and post bad data so you want to keep people aligned and you'll, you'll lose some money if you do the wrong thing but ultimately if you go ahead and appeal to ethereum you will get to the to the correct result here and that's basically how optimistic systems work so zk rollups give you a validity proof optimistic rollups optimistically just post the result and then they wait some period of time where anyone can go ahead and challenge that result result and then either no one challenges so it's accepted or if someone challenges the fraud proof mechanism is engaged and you get to the you figure out who's tell, who's lying there but ultimately you know this is in the implementation details already what they're both doing is proving the correctness of these assertions onto ethereum and allowing ethereum to validate them either by directly validating a validity proof or by engaging in the fraud proof process and seeing if there's a fraud proof and if so refereeing it to get to the right result that's that's amazing. So so maybe let's let's try to play this out even more. But before that, I do want to emphasize that Arbitrum uses optimistic rollups, right? And so uh, so that's one one important part of it. But I want to talk about these challenges or this appeal. How does that typically work? Because I know there there have been less than a dozen challenges so far in the history of Arbitrum. But how do these challenges work? Is that just a software client that the validators run? Yeah, so the the challenges are just a software client. Uh, it's a node, basically, that your node will pop up um, a notification that disagrees and says, hey, we should need a challenge. At that point, it will ask you to put down a deposit, the challenge, where there's no like long term deposits. But like, if you want to say, and, and that deposit, that's where the incentives come in. So like, you're going to want to think twice before you say the wrong thing and challenge something that's incorrect, because you're going to lose this deposit. But that's about it. Um, and yes, yeah, so actually, um, in production, there have not been any challenges on Ethereum. Um, but there is a very fun case where there was a challenge in, I guess, production. Um, so if you remember um, about a year ago, Ethereum had the merge and that's it's moved to proof of stake. And there were some that wanted to sort of keep the original fork of the network was called ETH POW or ETH proof of work. There was this other version of Ethereum. And what happens is when you fork the network, every, all contracts on it fork as well. So Arbitrum, there was an Arbitrum on ETH POW. And this ETH POW asset, the native asset, the ETH on that chain was trading maybe for like $6 at the time. And there was maybe a million or so ETH in the Arbitrum bridge. So someone was like, hey, I don't know if anyone's looking here. Why don't I try to like, drain all this from the bridge? And again, you know, so they're gonna, what they're gonna do is actually post a bad result, a bad assertion and see what happens. And if no one challenges it, you know, maybe they'll think, thought, you know, maybe no one's watching this chain, um, they'll be able to grab all the ETH. Uh, it turns out that there were validators active on the chain and um, they did not succeed in that attempt to steal all the ETH from the bridge. But that was actually the only time in a production environment where the uh, fraud proof mechanism was, was tested. Got it. 
Okay. So so maybe I, I do want to ask you about other layer two, Stephen, because I feel like you have a new L2 solution popping up every single month. And so <laughs> if I if I am choosing an L2 to interact with, more often than not, the first thing that I would check is I would go to l2feast.info and see which one's cheaper, right? And so how should people think about Arbitrum in terms of risk and security and not just transaction fee? Because it's really hard for someone to decide, hey, what L2 do I do I interact with? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And obviously fees are an important part of this, um, but understanding fees in the context of security model is obviously all important as well. Because like I said, if you, know, if you cut corners and if you, we can label AWS a blockchain and now you have a really, really low fee chain, but it doesn't actually give you the security and decentralization. So if you care about the security and decentralization, you should also um, look more broadly at not only the fees, but also the security model. Although I think Arbitrum fares very, very well in the fees comparison as well, but that's just a philosophical point. Um, and so the, I guess the, the important things that I'd focus on Arbitrum um, is from the technology perspective, Arbitrum is the most secure and most decentralized technology that exists. And that's in terms of the core technology, but also in the public instantiations of the technology. So um, this whole fraud proof mechanism that I've described, there are other chains that claim to be optimistic rollups, but, but actually Arbitrum chains are the only ones that have a working and built out fraud proof system. And that system today has about a dozen independent validators, including large organizations like the Ethereum Foundation, Google Cloud, Consensus, a mix of Web2 and Web3 players, and also we We've announced recently a new protocol called Bold that will open up challenges to everyone. So everyone in their uh, in their living room or their basement, wherever they may sit, <laughs> can go ahead and, and engage in the challenge protocol as well. So the technology is actually built out, and there are also other aspects of the technology that we're build, building out. For example, we recently launched a test net uh, with something called Arbitrum Stylus. And this gives you the ability to launch Rust, C, and C++ smart contracts co-equal with the EVM. So you can have a with uh, you know a Solidity contract that talks to a Rust contract, doesn't even know it's written in Rust, and this is something that's like never been done before and super cool. And yes, even the test that is shipped not only with fraud proofs for the EVM, but fraud proofs for all these other languages as well that comes uh, um, shipped there. So that's one thing. From a technical um, um, aspect, I think Arbitrum technology, both from a technical maturity, security, decentralization, is far along. But that's also true from an ecosystem perspective as well. So if you look at the Arbitrum public chains managed by the Arbitrum Foundation and Arbitrum DAO, they have the dominant market share among layer two rollups from a TVL perspective, from a developer interest perspective. Like if you look where DeFi you know, innovation happens, it generally happens in the Arbitrum ecosystem. So um, there's both technical reasons, but also really strong ecosystem, really strong network support. And that also leads to external, like, you know, you have, so since there's a Good, uh, there's a lot of value there and there's a lot of uh, projects there, you now have really good ecosystem support. So just about every you know centralized exchange supports deposits and withdrawals right onto the Arbitrum uh, networks. So that's like Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, you, know, you name it. You'll be able to go in and out of Arbitrum directly from an exchange and also um, you know, nodes, uh, Alchemy and Fura, Quick Node, Chainlink, you know, all this uh, service is, is obviously live on the chain. I think that's another really important uh, metric to, to look at as well. So I would say both from a technology perspective, but also from an ecosystem development perspective, Arbitrum are leading. And the third thing I'll finish off with is from a governance perspective. Um, when the Arbitrum DAO was launched and Arbitrum governance was launched, this goes back to March uh, of this year. Um, we at Offchain Labs really gave up control of the network uh, completely. So we don't have keys to upgrade the, the network. Um, this all, and the DAO actually has what's called self executing governance, right? So self executable governance, which means there's no like some, so, so sometimes, you know, so what, what am I talking about? So let's say you want to upgrade, upgrade the chain. We can't push an upgrade to the chain. We can write software, but ultimately the DAO has to actually vote on whether or not it wants to uh, implement an upgrade of the chain. Sometimes governance systems don't actually work like this. Sometimes governance systems have a vote, but that vote is really a signal. And then there's someone with a key somewhere that's sort of trusted to take the result of the vote and turn that key and do what it said. But that's not the case in the arbitrary ecosystem. It's a it's an unprecedented unprecedented level of decentralization of the governance. And the DAO actually controls directly not only the upgrades of the system, the technical roadmap, but also the uh, community token supply uh, and all that. And all the fees, by the way, for the all the ETH, besides for the ARB token, all the ETH that comes into the chain, some of it gets paid out on layer one to post that 
transaction data, but the rest of it actually goes directly to the Dow Treasury. So it's an unprecedented unprecedented level of governance uh, control, which I don't believe exists in um, any other layer two. So those are the three prongs which I focus on: security, decentralization uh, of the technology uh, and the governance, but also um, the ecosystem growth. And and fees are obviously important too, right? That's that's the that's why we started here. Fees and throughput are important too. I think arbitrage fears very well too. But you know, I know you mentioned aside from that, what would you yeah. like? So <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty excited about Arbitrum Stylus because I, I know a few game developers who build games in C++. And so now I can I can share that information that, hey, you know what? You could just you could write smart contracts. You could build on Arbitrum and have the same games poured over to Arbitrum. Uh, but uh, as a as a self delegator on Arbitrum, I, I do have a few questions around uh, maybe. So I read this blog post by by Ed, your co-founder on why he's optimistic about optimistic rollups. Mm -hmm. And so can you tell us why you are, are optimistic about uh, optimistic rollups in the near future? Because I know given your background, you did, uh, I'm sure you would have also considered ZK technology. In fact, you used to work, used to be a cryptographer. So you would naturally incline yourself to technologies like ZK. So why did you uh, choose optimistic uh, rollups? Yeah, and I did, you know, you mentioned some of my work at MPC, but I also did work uh, when I was at Microsoft Research um, around ZK, developed a signature, post-quantum signature system using a ZK proof system. Um, yeah, so I definitely, when we started to launch Arbitrum, it wasn't like ZK technology was foreign to us. Uh, I think we probably had more familiarity, at least at that point, than what many of the people building today. Um, but it was clear from, um, you know, three three different verticals back then, it's still clear to me today that optimistic rollups are the better bet. And number one was just cost. So we mentioned before when discussing the proving that succinct verification. So verification has to be cheap and easy. What we didn't mention is the cost to actually prove. So if this proof comes from, you know, dropped from the sky, it's easy to verify it. But networks also have to pay for the full cost of the network. So actually generating this proof um, is important. And the question is who can generate the proof, right? In Arbitrum, there's no... Additional cost to proving it's just running a node and you have a diversity of nodes if one goes down someone else can take over that role and it's very very nice and there's you know natural decentralization there's no exotic hardware involved but i think proving cost and proving time are one thing that's that's really important um and i think leads to optimistic roles to having a, a very big um, advantage because again optimistic systems have existed for a very long time they're they're their main benefit is they're optimistic in the sense you don't have to do the expensive work in the, in the, in the happy case. And it turns out here, even the non-expensive work is much more expensive in a ZK case because you always have to do these expensive proofs. And in ZK systems, so you prove over these objects called, you know, um, circuits or uh, these constraint systems and they're, um, they don't translate well to the natural model of the of the computing model of the EVM. You have to do this translation layer, which also adds inefficiencies. And if you look at oh, many ZK rollups, they often have lists of things that aren't supported, certain precompiles that aren't supported, and maybe they'll do hash functions differently, um, et cetera. And these you know, inconsistencies just don't exist in optimistic rollups. And by the way, even for things that they do support, there will often be incompatibilities because the gas accounting will be different, right? It turns out in running an optimistic rollup or running Ethereum, one of the cheapest operations you can do is run like a hash function like SHA-2 or SHA-3. It turns out in these ZK circuits, that's one of the most expensive operations you can do. So even if they build the gadget to do it, your ga gas account, if you're a contract, things that were expensive become cheap, things that were cheap become expensive. So there's a break of compatibility there as well. And that leads me to Stylus too. And that's the second one, which is flexibility. The idea is that we can add and we have added stylus support to bring these other contracts, these other languages into into the Arbitrum, you know, Nitro stack directly as first class citizens. To the extent that the, a lot of these ZK teams have had success um, in implementing the EVM, they've done a lot of, you know, hard coded engineering work to sort of, I mentioned they have these two computational models sort of fit, a, you know, a square into a circle hole and these are things that are, you know, became very, um, I think, difficult to innovate further on and now to expand these languages so easily like we did. And it wasn't so easy. It was a, you know, a year plus long project. But the idea is that there was a natural way for us to include WebAssembly and WASM contracts. I think that a lot of the innovation will be stifled. And this is one of the most interesting things, which is if you look at, you know, today, a lot of the arguments of ZK and Optimistic, 
they focus on things you can't actually feel, right? So you as a developer, like you can, you know that there's a proof system in the background, or in some cases you hope that there is. But even when there is, you know, it's you don't really feel the difference or know the difference. But now we're talking about the, but but they, they actually lead to differences elsewhere in the stack. I think Stylus is a good example where this is elevated to the forefront. It's like, okay, an optimistic system, I don't have to talk about some esoteric proving um, technology. I now have the capability to write contracts in other languages in way or for much cheaper in ways that I couldn't before. So it sort of elevates the debate into a practical difference than a theoretical difference. And you know, there's, uh, you know, I don't know if I should say this, but like there's, um, there's a tendency out there among people who um, know a little bit and want, you know, know enough to sound dangerous and sort of want to say the right thing. There's often this narrative that you should say, and there's no question about it now that you know, um, <laughs> like you know, it's it's the right thing to say in certain circles. Oh, we know zk will be the end game. You know, it's it feels right. A lot of people think that, and you know, people will, for example, appeal to um, and said, oh, this person said or that person said it, and. I always encourage people to actually, you know, engage with the facts and not you know, to engage with what they think is the right thing to be said if you want to sound intelligent. And the reason is, you know, I say just rewind a few years. If you look back, you know, and, and actually it's funny that we're having this conversation, this same, same, same conversation happened with Plasma. Plasma was the end game. When we were raising funds for off-chain labs to build out Arbitrum technology in 2018, I literally like I got into any investor call and they say, are you Plasma or are you a state channel? If I would say <laughs> neither, like I would be like yelled at, like, no, you have to one. This is the end game because um, we we were told this is the end game. And the smart narrative then was to say Plasma is the end game. Um, that's not a proof that, you know, ZK won't be the end game. I, I obviously have my, my view, which I've expressed, but it is a good idea to allow people to think critically and so, sort of some of the narratives that you're told to say today, if you just look at history and history has a tendency to repeat itself, you know, think critically and actually engage in the merits. And uh, from the cost perspective, from a flexibility perspective, from a maturity perspective, I think it's very clear to me, as clear as it was back then. And but despite the fact that the ZK teams have made incredible progress and they, they really are making incredible progress, it's, it's clear to me back then that optimistic rollups are the best and most decentralized way to scale smart content contracts today. And by the way, if you fast forward five years from now, I can promise you that everything we're talking about will look primitive. Just like if you look back, like, you know, we didn't know. And I don't know which direction that will go in. Will it be advances in ZK? I think we're a few breakthroughs away from ZK being competitive with optimistic rollups. Can those happen? Sure. Have they happened? No. Um, and there, there may be breakthroughs in other aspects of technology, but I'm sure we'll have a lot better, a, a much better understanding of how to design these systems in five years from now than today. And one of the keys to ma maintaining relevance is to, uh, you know, uh, is to really um, war be warm to that and be warm to innovation wherever it comes and be open to accepting these changes. If you take a look at the name of our company, we're off-chain labs, right? So I think if you look at just about every one of our competitors, the, the sort of type of proof system they have is built into their names. So you have Optimistic built into some companies' names. You have ZK built into others. You have Snark or Stark built into others. And I think that's the wrong approach because my mission here is not to scale blockchains with optimistic technology. It's to scale blockchains with the best technology available. And that allows me to be fully flexible. So if it turns out that these one or two, you know, breakthroughs happen and ZK rollups become better than optimistic rollups for some things, like I'd be fine advocating for, you know, their adoption in the Arbitrum technology, in the Arbitrum stack. I'm not opposed to that. That's, that's, that's my mission is to understand the technology, what's best today. I firmly believe that optimistic systems are the better answer today. But again, I haven't defined my mission in a way that requires me to lose if that becomes incorrect. Whereas some of these other, you know, companies that I referenced are, you know, very, very ingrained in their technology is yeah. not that we're going to solve the problem. We're going to solve the problem with this tool. And I don't know what the future holds. So I'd rather have that flexibility. So I have an opinion on today and we're going to continue developing the future in whatever direction that takes us. Wow. No, I, um, I definitely have to admit that I did get kind of sucked into uh, the plasma <laughs> narrative in 2017 when I, when I was thinking about plasma MVP, plasma cash. And then at the, on, I remember on the exact same day when I was going into uh, diving deep into Plasma, I remember writing a CERCOM circuit and I tried proving SHA-256 on CERCOM and it took two and a half minutes right. to generate that zero knowledge proof. And I was like, man, this is this is pretty slow. So so I, I do appreciate the commentary. And I think maybe just to, just to end the conversation, I have kind of a bizarre uh, personal question. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I know you spoke about uh, how a lot of these layer twos have their names focused on technology, right? So Optimism uses optimistic rollups. ZK Sync has the word ZK in it. Starknet comes from Stark, ZK Starks. 
How did you come up with Arbitrum? <laughs> So the answer is actually I didn't come up with Arbitrum. That actually predates. So if you go back to the academic uh, project, that was part of you know the initial um, project that Ed, le Ed led, and I only that sort of was a one semester thing that I follow for until I came back, came back from the White House, and we picked it up, you know, as a graduate level project and and published it and and really developed the system, you know, much further to what it is today. But one of the few things that um, remained or are actually the name Arbitrum um, and but it comes from our arbitration actually so mm -hmm. it's how we used to think oh. of people think it comes from arbitrage or arbitrary <laughs> it actually comes from arbitration which is how um, you know one way to view the system at least an early uh, understanding of the system was so you have these like warring or different opinions of what the you know core you know of what the blockchain said and these fraud proofs and then ethereum or whatever the blockchain system underneath um, is the arbitrator and does the arbitration between these opinions. Oh, okay. so it's a way to think about the fraud proof process and the, the role of the network. Um, but that's sort of ancient history at this point. No one actually can ask those two and thinks about that. It's sort of just arbitrum. <laughs> that, that makes a ton of sense. Because I was thinking, is it related to arbitrage? What, what, like, what is arbitrum? But maybe yeah. before, before I let you go, uh, Stephen, are there any sort of moonshot ideas that you wish to implement uh, in Arbitrum, but you haven't had the time or chance to to do it? Like, like, give us something. So where I sit, it's very much on the infrastructure layer. And when when it comes to moonshot ideas, I think one level beneath that. So real moonshot ideas um, that will reach the consumer will happen in the application layer. Mm -hmm. um, but we can create infrastructure that makes things possible that wouldn't be possible, el el you know, elsewhere or without that infrastructure. So I typically think about what are the things that we can do at our level of the stack to enable, you know, moonshot projects. And, you know, going back to Stylus for a second, that's one of one of the really exciting ones for me. And I'll, and I'll walk you through one particular um, aspect of why I'm excited. So we mentioned that Stylus adds other language support and you may say, and you may say, well, okay, great. So it adds some other languages we can, which is important because now we can expand to other developers. It doesn't compromise in the EVM at all. So you just have an EVM plus environment, but like, have we added the ability to do anything or is it just an affordance for developers, right? That's like a legitimate question. It turns out we've added like tremendous ability to do things that weren't possible before and uh, on two different um, axes. Number one is just computational throughput. It turns out that WASM or WebAssembly, which is by the way, the um, VM that's used mostly in web browsers and has a ton of development on it and a ton, a ton of innovation and years of uh, open source work. It's just really, really efficient and much more efficient um, than the EVM is today. And what that means is for the same, you know, amount of computational cost or the same sort of gas units, you can do a lot more. And in our, in our early benchmarks, we've seen like 10 to 100x, so one to two order of magnitudes increase in computational cost. Storage is still storage, right? Whatever you pay for what you store, but like in terms of the computational load on the nodes and what they can do for the same baseline price, you can do one to two orders of magnitude more. That's already exciting because it means another way to look at that is if everyone sort of moves over this or you can have one to two orders of a magnitude lower computational fees or additional one to two orders of magnitude more throughput on the chain, which is super exciting because scaling itself is a, is a cat and mouse game and you scale and then more users come, you can scale again. So this is not only a developer um, affordance, it's also a scaling tool that will bring much more capacity onto these chains. And I think natural forces will push people to use it over time. So you don't have to, you can continue EVM, but if that starts getting more congested and then you have a nice path where you can opt into to lower your fees and increase the throughput of the chain overall. But the second one is we discussed the developers and we discussed the sort of computational cost improvement, but it's also the code. So if you want to not only there are humans that have knowledge in these languages, but they also produced a lot of code. There are really good, for example, cryptographic libraries in Rust and C and C++ that you can now pull onto, into, onto the chain yourself and you don't have to re-implement the EVM. And by the way, sometimes because of, of, of the previous thing I discussed, because of the cost, they wouldn't even be feasible to implement an EVM. Now you, you can basically just pull this in. So you can think about this as almost like custom pre-compiles. So if you wanted to, you know, connect, you know, verify the a signature produced by a secure element in your phone or the like, you'd have to either do a really optimized Solidity implementation or, you know, try to go and get a new Ethereum or new Arbitrum pre-compile. And now you have like a really long, you know, potentially years long process, which may fail and has to get, you know, get social consensus on. Whereas stylus, you just 
oh, there's a C library that does this verification. Boom, I'm going to take that in. I don't need anyone else's permission and I can do that. And that's going to open up really new, I think, possibilities when it comes to uh, crypto cryptography, bringing advanced cryptography on chain. You're not limited to the couple of pre-compiles that exist today. You're not limited to the libraries, Solidity support for cryptography. You're not limited to the performance of Solidity. You have now the whole you know, C, C++ and Rust libraries um, at your uh, disposal, which I think is going to be extremely important, but also another area which... I can't really, you know, I'm not an application builder, so I don't really have the full imagination of what will be built, but AI and machine learning on chain, you can now use these languages, take off the shelf libraries to do some really, really wonderful things on chain that simply weren't possible before, both because of the computational limitations, but also because of the fact that the code just did, doesn't exist, but now, now it does. So I think we're going to um, see a ton of innovation there. And the last thing I'll end with is there's another thing we haven't discussed yet, which is called Arbitrum Orbit, which is the Ability for anyone to permissionlessly and freely launch their own chain in the Arbitrum ecosystem. I think Stylus is going to, so that's already super cool. I think people will do really cool things with chains, but connecting that with Stylus. You can have now Stylus on your chain. You can launch a new chain today. You don't need anyone's permission uh, with Arbitrum Stylus enabled. Um, but a really cool thing, which I think is underexplored, is if and when the DAO you know, votes to add Stylus support onto Arbitrum 1, you can now have, say, a Layer 3 chain hmm. that's built on Arbitrum 1 where the this advanced crypto or these advanced libraries are actually built into the chain itself. So into the sort of state transition oh. contract of the chain, you have these affordances on the base chain. I don't think we'll get that on Ethereum, but you can imagine building chains on Arbitrum which have that. And I think that's super exciting. So. It's sort of like a not exciting answer to your question because I sort of, you know, spoke about nerdy things and technical things. But the idea is these are unquestionably going to open up possibilities that were blocked off today for building really cool, super uh, moonshot like applications. And we're doing our part there, but, but it's sort of the precursor to the fun work that uh, I think really good application developers will do. Wow, Stephen, this has been this conversation has been so fun and so amazing. I I do want to give a big shout out to Stephen, to your co-founders uh, Ed and Harry, and all the lovely community builders of Arbitrum. It's uh it's because of builders like them that we are able to open up new dimensions for us to interact with the community in a decentralized way. So uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe to FCAT Crypto Brief on Spotify and Apple. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Crypto as an asset class is highly volatile, can become illiquid at any time, and is for investors with a high risk tolerance. Crypto may also be more susceptible to market manipulation than securities. Crypto is not insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or the Securities Investor Protection Corporation. Investors in crypto do not benefit from the same regulatory protections applicable to registered securities. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. This podcast was produced by the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology also known as FCAT. FCAT does not offer digital assets nor provide clearing or custody of such assets. It is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide tax, legal, insurance, or investment advice and should not be construed as an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy, or a recommendation for any security or other asset by any fidelity entity or third party. Views expressed are as of the date indicated based on the information available at the time and may change based on market or other conditions. Unless otherwise noted, the opinions provided are those of the authors and not necessarily those of Fidelity Investments or its affiliates. Fidelity does not assume any duty to update any of the information. Fidelity and any other third parties mentioned in the podcast are independent entities and are not affiliated. Mentioning them does not suggest a recommendation or endorsement by Fidelity. This information is not intended for distribution to or use by any person or entity in any jurisdiction or country where such distribution would or use would be contrary to local law or regulation. Persons accessing this information are required to inform themselves about and observe such restrictions. Third-party trademarks appearing herein are the property of their respective owners. All others are the property of FMR LLC. Copyright 2023 FMR LLC. All rights reserved. 1040156.